Hey guys, um, can everybody hear me? Uh, let me make sure that everything is in order. Okay, yep. OBS is working, getting the right source. Okay, sorry for the delay today. Hey guys. Oops, <laughs> I forgot to mute the stream feed. Um, so yeah, sorry for the quick uh, for the delay, eight minutes late. Um, so uh, let's get started. Um, so how's everybody doing? Does anyone have any uh, quick thoughts about the homework this month? Uh, so the homework that uh, I assigned for this month's apprentice assignment is um, uh, gesture animation. Uh, so it's about uh, movement, flow, uh, 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 rotation, motion, gesture in motion. Uh, so th though no moving animation is expected on the due date, but a lot of you did animate it anyway because you guys are awesome. Uh, a side-by-side -side framework of your sketches is, is expected for homework. So it's um, you uh, choose a video from YouTube of any gesture or activity of your choice, ballet poses, martial arts, sports, um, archery, or any kind of sport at all, um, and analyze the movement or one particular motion or move uh, that is specific to that sport or something, and uh, freeze and slow down uh, the freeze or slow down the video. And uh, choose your choose your frames and redraw them. Analyze the gesture. Analyze the bow. Analyze inversion. Analyze rotation. Um, and um, and the main frames that are selected are supposed to be the key frames behind the nature of the gesture or motion that you're choosing, with at least five frames sketched and handed in side by side. Uh, the purpose of this study is to get you into studying fluid movement. So what you do is you eventually go back into the two-dimensional flat single frame that you draw for your illustrations. But the point was stretching the muscles of animation in your mind, stretching them as far as possible, um, and stretching them to the point where you are working on active animations, actual animations. I didn't expect many of you to know how to use the animation um, uh, tool in Photoshop or how to put the frames together, but a lot of you did anyway, which is going to be amazing because you guys are going to see in a second what everyone was working on. Uh, but um, uh, the point of it is that when we go back into drawing frames that are for illustrations, let's say a book cover and a character is doing a very like a strong motion, uh, what happens is that, so I have a quick thing to show you guys, uh, what happens is that you understand eventually, so this is something I'm going to be looking at in uh, class today. Um, so this is one of the pieces we'll be looking at. Uh, so it was posted sometime yesterday. There we go. So this is an example of a frame uh, in an animation that is incomplete. This is an example of when illustration, though it's very well painted, colors are balanced, beautiful control, maybe composition is a little bit uh, damaged, uh, but it's an example of what happens when you don't study animation in motion, when you don't study gesture as a motion, as part of a bigger motion, as part of a bigger movement. When you go back to drawing um, uh, frames that are for illustrations, it's missing something. It's missing the frame before and the frame after. And that's the theme for today's class. Uh, what was the frame that came before and what was the frame that came after? Uh, so I'll be analyzing this piece and going back into your gesture stuff. So not every homework uh, will be responded with a, um, a uh, paint over from me. Some of the homework that I assign is not always glamorous or fun like this month's homework. It's very difficult and very trying. And I'll re read some of your reports because I asked you guys to write a quick report um, before class for me what your challenges were. Uh, but I will be looking at this piece specifically. This piece specifically. Um, and this piece here is uh, missing a uh, uh, upper body and lower body unison in the motion of an open gesture. So in my upcoming book, I'll be covering open and closed gestures. And I've covered them in the past and I've covered them in my previous books, which are no longer published. But um, uh, open gestures are gestures that are that belong to a ex an explosive motion. That, that are gestures that require a lot of energy, and usually a gesture that requires a lot of energy is a gesture that can't be sustained for very long, because that's just the nature of energy in the human body and rest and sleep, um, and just the burst. It's just burst. So when you are animating, and one of the questions that was asked is, how do you know which frames are the best frames? Well, you always have to choose the best frame of any motion for your drawing. You choose the best frame, like a photographer would choose the best frame. So burst motion is a motion that I represent with an X. Um, whenever I'm drawing a gesture and I don't have any X-like combination of CS or I lines, 
uh, what happens is that I end up not really representing that burst of energy, that explosive motion. Um, so we usually have lines that are uh, very elongated for gestures. We're usually choosing still life type of gestures or gestures of motion that um, are like walking or contemplative. When it comes to drawing stuff that is very, very um, explosive, very high energy, usually the face needs to be distorted or something. Students usually don't have a... Uh, I'm not sure why my tablet is um, on the wrong screen. Uh, let me just uh, all this top area. Okay. I'm not sure why it did that. But um, usually we have uh, a combined effort between upper and lower body. But here, this if I rotated the canvas, it'll just look like she's leaning on something with her lower body. So that's criteria number one. Unify upper and lower body. So upper and lower body have to be unified of going for the same direction. There's a target and the body is explosively moving towards that target if it is this kind of gesture, which is why I offered you guys to look for ballet or um, uh, sports. And you'll notice that a lot of the explosive gestures you guys researched and you guys studied have that defined X shape to them. So let's take a look at this one very, very defined X shape. And by X shape, I just mean upper X and lower X are upper body and lower body. And they're all representing this outward movement of energy in order to execute whatever the action is. And some of the best gestures that I've seen handed in are the ones that have that very flexible, open, elongated gesture to it. Um, another really massive, really, really important thing about, um, let me find it, really, really important thing about open gestures is the squash and stretch, uh, which is an animation uh, technique that is used to uh, exaggerate motion, to really give it that extra oomph when uh, looking around or turning around, when anything is exaggerated in caricature or otherwise. Um, you see it used everywhere. Uh, but squash and stretch is a, uh, a way to push the keyframe of an explosive gesture um, to, to more than its maximum. So let's say you're throwing your arms up in the air. You're not actually going to stretch in real life. Your arms go to a length and then they come back down. In animation, we do that. We, we, we stretch all the way and further. And then that way, it's just a single second or half a second or a millisecond frame, really, that actually has that full-on elongated, the complete elongation. It doesn't last very long in an animation. But what it does do is that it helps you exaggerate the openness of a gesture. And you can't really squash and stretch on a closed gesture. So these are um, portraits here, um, but this kind of comedy back then style was very physical comedy. So I wouldn't really consider this um, an issue to do with open gesture, but I could call these open portraits. Um, it's kind of just the way they're exploding in the expression, whereas it's not energy anymore. Energy is equated to expression in this case, in this particular piece right here. But everywhere else, especially this, this, um, the squash and stretch, you're exaggerating the moment before and the highest motion, highest moment of the animation uh, frame of the, mo of the action, whatever the action is. So squash and stretch is related to open gestures. Upper and lower body have to respond to that. So this is a very specific sport. Uh, upper body is definitely open. Lower body is not. Um, I usually, um, it's usually not legs together for a, for a basketball throw like this. Usually the legs are very elongated X. So I would actually just have some space in between the two legs. Um, sometimes for show, showmanship, they kind of put their legs together just to have that really elegant, um, uh, kind of like a three-pointer shot. Uh, but um, upper and lower body have to be synced in that they are working with the same explosive energy to complete the same task. Um, and the squash and stretch helps you exaggerate the motion, even if you're not animating. So this is especially prevalent for animation because, again, animation is that added fundamental, uh, that three-dimensional added dimension. Um, where your drawing is not still but rotating in space. The canvas no longer is a flat page. It is an open space. It's the object is existing in the space, uh, in the world of the canvas. So that's like next level, um, like a higher uh, final form of your drawings. They move in their space. But 
Because this is single frame, how do you squash and stretch in a single frame? You definitely do. You absolutely do. So the upcoming challenge for uh, the community is going to be a um, uh, shot, not shot put, um, the long jump, not the long, the, the, I forget, I cannot believe I forgot the name of it. It's, there are so many of them. Let me get the name for you. Uh, so it is called Pole Vault. Um, no, not Pole Vault. Ja javelin? Pole Vault? Javelin? Javelin? Hurdling? <laughs> my god all right it's javelin um javelin is when they no it's not javelin it is not javelin it is pole vault it's the rack pole vault pole vault is when they use a very very long pole to cross a degree of distance and overcome a very very high obstacle raised really really high usually a bar stretched in between two poles um so the next challenge is going to be pole vault and i'm going to talk really quickly about what how we're going to be applying um, squash and stretch open gesture to this. So one of the requirements for this upcoming challenge, and I haven't published it yet, it will be out soon if, for anyone who's looking forward to it, uh, but one of the requirements is that the character is using pole vault as a way to interact with their environment so that the, char the, 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 the artist who's working on this illustration has to design the environment as they design the character. One reflects the other. That's the requirement. And so that's the context, but the gesture of the character in their environment, so it's got to be like 70% environment, 30% uh, uh, character. Uh, so it's not a character design, but there will be an opportunity for you to zoom out so that the entire illustration will be zoomed out, um, just like we kind of have over here in this piece. So the entire illustration is zoomed out. You don't see much of the character. You can't depend on facial features. What can you depend on? Exaggerated, open gesture, uh, motion, readable from a distance. The character is only 30% of the illustration, so how do you maximize on that? Um, it might be a multiple characters. It might be a group of characters. Uh, the way I describe it is a based, it's going to be a based off requirement thing. Uh, so I'm going to have, I'm going to say you have to have a character. They have to have this theme and that's it. Everything else is free reign design wise. Uh, but um, this piece right here, if this was for any reason, it's a bad angle. It's a leveled angle, really bad for an illustration. Uh, but, uh, but this, this is wonderful, this one. Um, but, um, how would you exaggerate the gesture? Well, most importantly, you would exaggerate the most immediate line, this marker right here. You try your best not to allow it to take over the illustration. A line is a directional, has direction power to it. Uh, so you would keep the gesture um, or the motion of the pole vault at, at its most extreme, uh, just like how we have these frames. This is the motion we choose. This one is great. This one is uh, has a lot of momentum. These two have a lot of momentum, but they can look extremely awkward. This is the best scene because it is the most uh, best frame because it's the most dynamic. It's the most open. Just take a look at that X. It's the most open and it is the most perspective based. So it's the most beautiful. So you try to find in the pole vault and you guys kind of have this lesson to back you guys up the most extreme and profitable uh, uh, frame in the uh, motion. Okay, so we go back to this piece here and do you ask, if we were to ask the question, is this the most profitable frame from this gesture? Is this really the gesture that helps portray the most action, the most energy, the most storytelling power? I would say no. Um, I would say that this piece is very uh, quiet, that the fact that the legs are not really ahead of the body, that there isn't much of a lunge. Um, if this character was running, it feels like they're about to fall forward. I would feel like they need more of that uh, openness in the X shape. So we've got this and we've got this. And I kind of just connect it like that as an X. A very, very simple way of remembering just like CSRI, X or O. This is for closed gestures, by the way. And I do talk about this in my upcoming book. And I'll be able to give you guys some uh, chapters very, very soon once I finish editing them on um, all the concepts uh, of just, just some... Uh, select chapters from uh, from what I from what I've written on this chapter just just to reflect uh, today's other uh, this this month's uh, lesson um, to solidify it for you guys so hopefully I'll be able to copy paste that uh, for you guys or just upload a, a word file uh, but you'll 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 know what the O means eventually uh, but my main concern is finding the most energetic most profitable most high energy storytelling power 
gesture, the upper and lower body have to be unified. And that's kind of the way that the X reminds me or the way I coined this or, or thought of it is that the X reminds me to keep everything separated. There has to be breathing room between all major limbs of the gesture. Um, so if I were to be um, you know, designing or at, like putting together any kind of gesture that is high energy, high open, it doesn't have to be a perfect X. It can be an X that looks like that. It can be an X that looks like that. Um, it can be subject to perspective. So this looks like a character that's kind of just like bouncing forward or being hurtled forward or something like that. Um, so it ha doesn't have to be a perfect X, but the X reminds you that there is breathing room because these legs and these limbs are separated and they are high energy. So if I were to fix this piece here, which is not the best frame this artist could have chosen, I would start instantly with something like this. I would try some of that squash and stretch so I would really get this arm out um, and just really get that uh, motion forward. I'd exaggerate the energy for the back leg as the supporting leg, the supporting trunk, um, and I'd kind of give the body a little bit more of a, of a bend in the spine. Oh no. So I just updated my Photoshop, if you guys can tell, and it is really bad. It jitters, but it's at least it's not a performance jitter, it's just a graphics jitter. Alright, and I would push the face even more, stretch the hair backward, hair is an attachment, it's a wonderful way to describe motion or forward motion. I would throw that arm back even further. And then you have the legs. And so this upper body is just being forced forward, like high energy run. And then of course we have the adjustment for the arms and legs. So before, after, a little bit more tense, but not really tense. Tense in the fact that there is a burst of energy. And just take a look when I get rid of these legs and just leave the sketch lines. Look at how much more power is in that arm because of the space we delivered in between all these features here, all these limbs. Okay, so I'm getting rid of this. I'm getting rid of this. And then sometimes the attachment should be factored in later. So if there is a weapon or something, try not to factor it in if it doesn't have any major role. So if this was a sword, I'd say a sword, you'd probably want to factor that into the gesture. So you'd sketch the gesture early on with a sword or whatever the story narrative is, is, is guiding you towards. But if she's just holding a big um, marker like this, I wouldn't really um, factor it into the gesture. I try to make sure I have the best run possible. Okay. All right, so something like that. As for the shape of the, um, I believe they're drawing Diana from League. I'm not really sure. Um, as for the, uh, the, um, the weapon they had, I would probably make them hold the weapon like this or hold the weapon like this or get this hand to hold the weapon because a weapon like this is not very streamlined imagine cars were shaped like this while they're driving <laughs> it would be not very aerodynamic at all like this is, would be the front seat of the car not very aerodynamic it's not really supporting but when a car is shaped like or shaped like that you know it feels a lot more aerodynamic it feels a lot more bird like um, so when a character is moving forward and you're using this which is basically like a brake system for the air um, you want to obviously do the opposite have everything kind of like stretching across just like the squash squash and stretch uh, stretching across the motion um, and uh, helping deliver the feeling that there is a really really high energy motion disturbing the air around it so I would not put that there I would put that there that's really helped the character move forward as for the position in the camera, of course, there's always issues with camera when it comes to students. They're not choosing the right angle. So today you guys studied um, uh, frames of a possibly really leveled camera. Um, so I'm going to look over some of the work. Really, really leveled camera. Remember that if you guys are going to be applying these to illustration, we've covered this before in lighting and, and when we talked about composition and you guys drew those uh, uh, character designs for me, the lurker. Um, and the environments. Uh, I told you guys use the angle of the camera as much as possible. Um, really capitalize on what you can get out of a low or high camera. So yes, you've studied this today and you've learned a lot about fluid motion, about the stretches and 
and and uh, about the energy and about the direction and about um, uh, the important frames. You've learned all really, really valuable fundamentals from the study, which I invite you to repeat again in a month or two on your own. But uh, remember that if you're applying these back to illustration, you have to start thinking like a cameraman. Again, you have to start thinking like a movie director, lowering the camera and getting this angle out there with the rocks really, really high. This is exactly what I would use in my reference um, if I was designing the pole vault uh, illustration as uh, for, the, for the upcoming challenge. I'd make really, really high rocks behind the character uh, to show that it's a, it's a really high elevation kind of environment system around them that they can't get around unless they pole vault. Uh, so that's how they hunt, that's how they travel, that's how they uh, uh, scope areas. That's just how they. That's how they do. Um, and uh, everyone is athletic in that tribe. Uh, women carry their babies on their bodies and pole vault. Um, it's just a really specific kind of um, unison. A really beautiful synergy between character and environment. And this is a perfect angle for me to show both the character's power, their action. It's not really in the way. This little stick. It's just out of the way. And it gives me a chance to use a low camera angle to reveal the environment behind them. Um, another example is this is a great this is this one right here, really really high energy. Um, uh, this is really really high energy too. Maybe if I had uh, two characters pole vaulting, maybe two brothers messing around in the environment, I would choose this one for one brother and this one for another brother. Um, and these would be the two frames I use for both of them. Uh, some in the distance, maybe a, if I was going to be designing 10, 10 members of the tribe or 10 hunters from the tribe, uh, all kind of uh, dealing with the same hurdle in the environment, they're all at the same level getting over. Maybe there's a boar running away or another uh, creature that I've designed myself to suit the environment that knows how to travel along the environment, they have to kill it uh, for food, for sustenance, so they're all hunting and, uh, and chasing after it. I would have a number of characters, and I'd use all of these in their own uh, in their own way. So um, uh, to represent different characters. So one of these uh, would be the landing one. Maybe they don't land. Maybe they don't, they don't they don't do the whole landing thing, but they definitely do the build up, and they land on the environment behind them, um, and they kind of just swerve their sticks back in front of them. So the best gestures are the ones that we see right here. The ones that deliver the most change, the ones that are a very a, a new transformation from the previous ones. So how do you choose the best frames is one of the questions that was asked. Uh, the best frames are the ones that are an extreme frame or a frame that, that, has, that represents a lot of change from the frame before it. Um, oh, Vengeful Spirit, Dota 2. Oh, okay. Um, well, I didn't know that. I don't play Dota. Uh, but uh, but the frames that are the best are the frames that um, look best. They look the best. The frames that are uh, representing a new new ch like a new change in the environment, a new relationship with the object. Um, so this frame, this frame, this frame, this frame, this frame, and this frame. If we were to be animating these and putting, let's say, one key, one one. Uh, um, I uh, forget what it's called, one in-between frame, one fill frame in between, in between all of these, uh, then it would be a very, very slow animation. Uh, so one way to choose the best frames is to ask yourself how fast you want the animation to look, how slow you want it to look. Uh, so if you are choosing the best frames um, and it's a quick animation, you would choose this guy, this guy, not this guy. This is an in-between. Uh, because look at the difference between this and this. Not much change, but the difference between this and this is much, a lot of change. So we would choose the in-between because eventually by tweening, because we've put one frame behind the other, the in-between automatically happens. The in-between just, our brain fills in the rest. We don't actually have an in-between, our brain fills in the rest. So the best way to choose the frame is to ask yourself how fast it's going to be going. Uh, what the energy you're describing is, um, how much you're going to be depending on squash and stretch, and um, and really what, what what the relationship is with the object. Do, if it's a quick throw, we don't need this frame. Uh, we don't need this frame either. It could be just something like that. So all you got to do is just to test it out. So look back and forth between this and this, and that's pretty much what animators do when they flip their paper. We're looking back between this one and this one. So um, dart your eyes really quickly between this and this. You kind of just fill in the rest, don't you? 
you don't actually need these two guys. So this frame and this frame are key frames because they represent a massive change, a new relationship with the object. Um, and then this frame and this frame is all we need. This one and this one. So dart your eyes back and forth. Because the ball has now been released, the ball is doing its own business. It's going to be animated in its own way. Um, when the ball is animated, also we stretch it. Uh, we elongate it. It becomes an oval. And we do that because, again, squash and stretch. Um, we're exaggerating the forward motion to represent the direction in which it's moving. So we squish it because aerodynamically, even physically, it does happen, but like a very undetectable degree. I mean, it'd have to be a really deflated basketball for it to actually flop around <laughs> like a frisbee. Um, but, yeah, but the direction that we're moving in is how we can exaggerate. So you wouldn't squash and stretch horizontally if the character is moving vertically. If the character is moving vertically, you stretch vertically. Okay? So any questions at all? I'm going to be reading through these, but beautiful work. But you see how slow the frame is? Even if you sped it up, um, it would be a, a quite a slow frame, a slow animation. I also asked you guys to choose, the part two of the homework is to choose one of the frames and render them um, and see if you can fill in the, an, uh, the anatomy. So this is a very big uh, test because it's a transfer from uh, uh, lines to form where it's no longer really, and I don't think you chose the best frame we could have. I think the better frame out of all of these was this one right here. This one or this one. Look at the bend in the spine. So beautiful. Really well done. Really well captured. I love the way you drew the legs, by the way. Uh, but this would be the best um, uh, frame. This one's kind of boring. Feels a little bit like an action figure. Very stiff. Uh, but one big critique that I have for this particular render is that um, you've overlapped the arm in front of the torso. The arm is beside the torso. The arm clicks in like an actual ac action figure. So we don't have... Uh, an arm layering on top of the body. That's not that's not how it works, unless the arm grew out of the shoulder, unless the arm grew out of the back. Uh, so that's typically what that's looking like. So instead of this line being in front of this line, this line should be in front of the arm. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take a look at some of the other ones. Uh, for this piece, um, I, I like what you did. I like how you uh, rotated it. I like how you um, kept your lines very, very clean, counted. Um, a lot of you chose stuff that has clothing in it. I really wanted you to just actually try to find characters and leotards or something like that. This is really well done. Uh, one thing, though, that's completely missing, especially because you had a chance to look into each frame as you drew it. It was a single three second animation so you had a lot of uh, opportunity to perfect each frame there's not much of a representation between the bend of the knee and the and the uh, ankles and the calves in between um, so we kind of completely lose the form in the legs you start off with some great um uh, uh, i don't think I would, there's a frame by frame you start out with some great indication for the knee right at the front right at the start right there uh, but as, as the frame develops, we kind of lose her body type. It kind of feels like we suddenly looked at a male. Uh, so stay consistent in the body types you're representing. And in animation, when you're animating and trying to make a, a read, uh, and remember how in cartooning we exaggerate the female body? Uh, well, when we animate, we exaggerate even more. We kind of exaggerate everything. Um, in that female body. So one really, really good example is Jessica Rabbit. I really hope I'm not finding some like really nasty stuff. Um, gif. But with Jessica Rabbit, which is like the extreme of female body proportions, um, what they've done is they've not only drawn her with like a non-existent waist, uh, but look at how they animated her. They animated everything. It just looks like an hourglass walking, literally. Um, there isn't much that they've, um, they've ha I'm trying to find a good frame here, something bigger than this, but yeah, the exaggeration, no female walks like that, but you see how in, in the animation they exaggerated it, and they chose the best frames, do you see that, so one, two, three, and then the final frame, of course they have in-betweens, it's a slow walk, it's a sensual walk, but even in animation, you're exaggerating female proportions. You don't want to lose them. Um, and that's typically what happened with this piece. So that's my critique on this one. 
for this piece here, I love what you're doing, uh, but we kind of don't really have a polished representation of what's happening. If it was animated, it would actually look really, really amazing because it would have that messy, animated, hand-drawn look. Um, I feel like you lose a lot when you don't draw the foot. I feel like we've lost the foot a couple of times here. Maybe because you didn't give yourself enough space. It's hard to find where the other leg is. So it's, I don't know if this is a leg or, or a, no, it's not a sheet. It's not the, the one with the sheet. They already have the, um, the acrobat um, swing. So yeah, we do lose the foot in some of these. And the foot is really important because look what the foot has, has done. It's created a point to what? To mark the what? Can anyone answer the question? What does the foot do? What does it complete? What shape? I'm just going to wait for the answer. This one has clothing. Um, I would have liked to see this one without uh, clothing, just so that you can look at how the body behaves under all of that. We lose a lot of the gesture when we have clothing because it just, it's like padding. You don't actually see the framework or the skeleton. It's like flesh on skeleton. We're trying to see the skeleton as much as possible. And skeleton is like non-existent. Uh, when we uh, when we're looking at a, a body through clothes, uh, yes, the X exactly the foot, the legs, the whole complete lower half is missing when you don't draw the feet. So in a study like this, please make sure you are drawing the feet. Um, so if we were to talk about which ones are the best frames, I would say this is the best frame, this is the best frame, and this is the best frame. Uh, so these are the frames that you would choose to draw. Again, but if you're animating, you either have in-betweens or no in-betweens. You just have keyframes if the animation is super fast. Beautiful job. I love the way you represented the skip and the land, the way you rotated the foot. Amazing work. Forward and back. Wonderful job. The arm at the start is a little bit long. But you don't really notice it once it's animated because that's the squash and stretch. So here is where we could actually stretch her body even more. And I think you do kind of reach a really high point. Wonderful work. I would love for you guys to finish these and polish them and publish them on your portfolios. This homework today is going to sing Figaro in your portfolios. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be operatic. It's going to speak volumes. So if you guys actually publish these and put them up as gifts on your websites, um, it's going to show a lot. It's going to show discipline. It's going to show anatomy knowledge. It's going to show work workflow. It's going to show your skill level and, and obviously open a lot, a lot of doors for you guys for employment opportunity. Um, but this kind of study does not go uh, without reward just in itself. Um, the best uh, artists, the best drawers, those, those who the best drafters, the best at drawing with their line efficiency and flow and movement and rotation are animators because they are being tested in the highest form, which is being tested with open space, being tested with the third dimension. Uh, so your drawings will look so much more open, so much more fluid if you have more of these animation studies in the back. Okay, so the render for this one is actually really, really great. Um, I love the way you cast the shadows. Um, don't be so focused on the face, but I feel like you did lose a lot on the face. Um, you're always kind of concerned with keeping the face looking forward. That by this line down, we should have been seeing the chin. Uh, but you kind of just allowed the mouth to fall a little bit. By the time the mouth, by the time the upper lip starts, the mouth should have finished. But where the lower lip is now and where the chin is, this chin is massive from this distance. Uh, because it's not just the chin, it's the neck, but you drew it like it was uh, into all chin. Uh, so that, that has broken the perspective a little bit. But uh, I think you did wonderfully with the legs. I think you did great with the animation. All right, so I'm going to just track it. Okay. So for this frame right here, when she lands, she has to land with a squash. Uh, so when she lands with a squash, her body is going to be a little bit more um, distorted. So let me show you really quickly on Photoshop how we would squash so that we can, uh, you know, the demonstration makes it that much more easy to understand. So when she lands, she's landing with force. It hurts to land. So what she, what she has to do sort of 
is a little bit of that. If this is not in your reference, that's fine. It's in your uh, privilege and it's, it's in your right to exaggerate. But look at what happens when we squash. Compare frame one to frame two. Because now you have a motion back up. And the motion back up is just an extra wonderful way of uh, undoing the C shape and you have some content. Uh, in between this frame and this frame because she doesn't land like her arms or stick attachments glued on. She lands as a fluid body. We're just big sacks of water and a little bit of sticks here and there to keep us together. So we still flop around when we run. Have you ever seen like the slow-mo guys um, doing slow-mo like uh, ball throws or being slow-mo punched? We're just fluids. <laughs> we are fluid bags of something. Um, so we, we want to represent that it's a fluid form. When animating a car, even then in animation, we, we add a fluid nature to the car or anything solid when it's moving. So if you're watching any of the old animations, especially Akira, uh, you'll see that the motorcycles are stretched. Some, some frames of motorcycles just look like pills because they just look like little capsules because the, you can't animate the geometric shape um, and in motion it, when something moves. Remember that trick you guys can do with your pen when you're making your pen look like it's made of jelly, when you're just holding the center of your pen and you're just waving it back and forth. Um, that's what we're doing is that we are, because of motion, the object behaves like a fluid, behaves like a non-solid object. So because of that, we squish the object and elongate the object the way we would if we were throwing a water balloon, how it would move around. Um, so that's something that you could have done. For this piece, I would squish her stomach just a little bit more and kind of toss up because it feels like this is a breathe in moment, like breathe in as much as possible. So this would be the breathe in and then exhale. Um, so the breathe in means that a, a forward looking or, or forward bent, really, really straight back, uh, tucked in stomach. So all of the, the, the signatures for someone breathing in and then releasing just like that. And when we release, we kind of give the gut back its little C shape. Actually, just right where I started with you. Um, and we kind of relax the back a little bit. She does have to keep her posture, um, but uh, we're kind of just letting her relax a little bit after that jump. And then she can start breathing in again. Uh, for the next motion, which I'm sure is exactly what she had to do in order to perform the motion. Okay, so before, after, before, after. Okay, let's continue. Any questions at all? I'll be reading through the questions you guys wrote for me, but any questions at all? This is wonderful. This is an example of, a, of an open gesture. Of course, the X is right there uh, uh, for viewing. I think you did the run wonderfully. You chose some wonderful frames. And I love the little bob in the head. Wonderful work. Again, I would love to see you guys um, complete these and polish them. Wonderful work. One, two, three, four, Five. and then squish. Very, very wonderful. So there's something called rotoscoping, um, which is when they paint over a video to make better animation. And they eventually figured out they could do it, and they started doing it. And it was just a really, really great way of finishing work fast while maximizing realism. Um, so right here, all of this stuff is really, it's a wonderful way of uh, finishing work, but it has one downfall. It's really easy to spot. So eventually animators started, um, uh, so you can see the head shape here, right? Look at the head shape, it's very, very symmetrical. But look at the head shape here, much larger than the body. Um, look at the legs and the knees. Very, very straight, very rigid, very realistic. Um, lots of rotoscoping in uh, uh, Snow White, uh, but it, it, it was really easy to tell they were sketching over someone. Um, so eventually they started exaggerating features. They started exaggerating stuff to look a little bit more circusy, a little bit more circus-like. Um, so you can see the female, she's just standing there. She's not really doing much, but the big head, the head tilt, um, uh, all of that uh, you know, larger shapes helped interrupt this 
thin stiffness of the human body in camera. Um, so look at the knee, the big feet. The proportions are all intact. You have to draw proportionately. But the big head and large shapes so the triangle here helped interrupt that really, really boring look. Also the forward motion in his body versus this. It kind of took a lot of liberties in the way they animated Peter Pan compared to his actor or in the uh, model they used for him. Okay, so when I'm looking at this, it feels like rotoscoping. So what you can do is use the squash and stretch. You can um, use larger feet, smaller feet. You can really mess with it so that you have your own individual style. And that's a very uh, dangerous word to use. I try to be careful with that word. Um, but style is not so much um, an issue when you're animating because hopefully you're animating along accurate rotation proportions. You're not animating stuff that you know can't rotate. Like the way they animate Fairly Odd Parents, it's just flat, look side to side. There's no rotation. You don't see the front view and then the side view if someone's turning around. There's either the side way to draw Jimmy or whatever his name is and front view and three quarter view and that's just the three frames they use and you're always in that single angle it's very flat and ironed out but when you're drawing a style that's supposed to be rotated by the time you're trying to rotate the style you're already at proficient uh, line efficiency so it's not so much an issue anymore because if you s animate proportionately it's going to look very very uh, rigid and stiff I know that's a really really weird thing to say animate proportionately but not too proportionally because it'll look stiff um, but um, let me find something for you. So this is um, the duet. Okay, so it's a very, very beautiful video about animation. It's an animated video about love and all of that. I'm sure you've all seen it. But some of this obviously has been referenced. So let me find the part where the dance really starts. Okay. There we go. So take a look at the feet, the body, the proportions. They're all their own individual style. They don't have any any of that rigidity of rotoscoping, but that obviously has been referenced. All right, so you see the waist, the movement, stylization in, in moments. But the motion is still extremely, extremely readable, fluid. But the hands are huge. The feet are huge. So I invite you to try some of that so that you don't have any of that rotoscoping um, effect. But this is all if you are moving in an animation direction. Um, if this is all going back to your illustrations, then it's going to be a little bit more... See that? See that look? And I'm sure you know what I mean by that look, that very rigid, realistic look. And that's if you sketch directly on top, which isn't beneficial. The legs were completely rotoscoped, but the top, upper body was not. See that? The proportions are way too rigid. Her head is huge, though, so that's the one kind of redeeming factor and not getting that nasty rigid look when it comes to rotoscoping but um, yeah oh yeah this is fire and ice tons of it this entire movie was just sketched out of I um, uh, forget what it's called tracing it's complete tracing one big giveaway for tracing is the line of the cheek that line of the cheek is something hard to ignore for an artist. So <laughs> they kind of have it there. And as soon as it's there, you know they've been rotoscoping. <laughs> See that? It's there in Snow White as well. It's an old style thing they used to do. Where is that when the dude wakes up? Well, he doesn't have it because he wasn't smiling. So that's the big giveaway. Okay. There we go. <laughs> uh, 
Um, that's something you don't want to carry into your style. That's something you want to avoid if you want to jump into some more animation. But use rotoscoping. You can take a video of yourself doing a motion, analyze it like we did today, because that's exactly what you guys did. You, you guys traced right over or moved with the animation. You froze it and drew it. But remember, it's very obvious if you work really, really close with your reference. You want to stylize wherever you can, enlarge the feet, enlarge the hands if you need to. Those are really, really big style carriers, hands and feet. And of course, the face, that's a whole other ball game uh, in cartoon portraiture. But um, be very careful with that. Make sure you have just a touch of style in there to keep things spicy. All right. So beautiful renders. And I wanted it more of a focus on the motion. So right here in this final frame where he kicks, that's a stretch frame. You could have really carried so the foot ends right here. You could have made the foot end right up here and stretched it right up there. That's how far that foot could have gone. And he could have bent his legs a little bit more, maybe a little bounce on the on the uh, landing, just a little up and down. But beautiful job on that really, really fast kick. And remember that if you are trying to animate something that starts slow and then kicks fast, um, you're following your reference completely. That's what your reference has to be doing. You can't speed up and slow down while, you're, while your reference is doing the opposite. You have to make sure you're moving with your reference or else it'll look really, really awkward. Intentionally graceful, um, unusually slow, and the, and the motion, the nature of emotion and being open and being uh, high energy is in its speed, uh, emotions in its speed. So please make sure you guys are remembering that. Uh, and with speed, there's a lot of distortion in shape uh, and, uh, and, and um, uh, gesture. You want to exaggerate gesture, choose the best stuff. So some of the questions that were asked um, or some of the stuff that was um, uh, kind of your reports for how you guys dealt with this month is um, Katie says you were surprised at how difficult it, it was. Uh, I've been focusing so much on portraits and rendering that doing quick gestures and getting proportions right was a lot harder than I thought. I enjoyed it though. I did a few more, uh, a few before the homework I submitted and it felt it, get, it was getting easier as you went along. Um, of course it's difficult because at this moment it's not single frames of light on form. Things just seem so easy now. You guys took it for granted and now you guys are going to be back to rendering faces and you're just so happy it's all over. Uh, the nightmare is over. But I had to get you guys to stretch like this. I had to get you guys into this, break you into this um, field of study. Uh, because what, you, what it offers you is a whole other world of dimension you won't be able to unsee next time you draw on a two-dimensional canvas. Uh, as for questions, I think the main thing I want to know is how to get proportions right when doing gestures. Um, so it's very, very easy to get lost in a long line. Let's say you're drawing the C shape and you're adding the head and you forget to add the feet or you add the torso and you add the head later and the neck is too long and everything looks weird and funky. The most important thing to do after you get your C shape down is find the head and the feet because you've designated the start and the end of the painting. When you draw, I mean the, the, the gesture, when you draw the feet, make sure the feet are as long as the face is. Um, so just grab your, if you can carry your feet to your face, you can measure it. But the foot is just as long as the forearm. So your entire foot length is your forearm length, give or take a couple centimeters or inches, not a half inches, let's say. Um, so the foot is supposed to be pretty long. And I think that's where a lot of you guys fall off. Um, when you draw the right foot size um, and then bring it back to the head, um, and then of course find the rest of the body, eight heads across, eight waist up is eight, waist down is eight. You have eight heads, long body, two heads laying side by side width for the shoulders. Um, it becomes very easy to fall into the right, something that looks right. It's not that hard to make to fall into the what looks right. It's also not hard to fall into the uncanny. But that's because you guys leave the feet to the end like they don't matter. The feet are absolutely necessary, as you saw today. They are the completing point of the gesture line, of the X representation of the energy, of the explosion of the burst. Uh, so don't forget about the feet. That might be something that helps you um, get better proportions as you move along. How to decide which frames are more important. So I've been answering that. Uh, with this month's homework, I felt as if my render was stiff because I was concentrating so much on creating the muscle forms, and I struggled on creating the illusion of movement in the sketches. But it really helped with me, uh, helped me in understanding gesture. I feel more confident that I can create more dynamic poses in my future drawings. Yes, because you're thinking of the frame before and after your chosen gesture. It's not just the gesture line or frame that you're going to be choosing 
think about where it came from and where it's going because that's going to make you stretch and it's going to make you uh, release the gesture. It's going to make you um, uh, squash the gesture where you need to. Uh, maybe half the body is in the old frame, half the body is in the upcoming frame. Uh, so you're just really thinking about the, uh, the constant motion behind the single frame you've decided to draw. Um, I discovered the importance of gesture, but also how hard it is to be accurate with a tablet versus a pencil. Yeah, definitely. If you are still dealing with the learning curve of a tablet, I suggest some simple circle studies before I've, I used to assign those to all my students. Circle studies, um, just drawing a bunch of circles, that's all it is. Uh, probably like a good 500 circles before you start drawing. It'll really help you get into the uh, dashboard and help you be a little bit more confident with your lines. It'll get you through the ugly lines. You gotta get the ugly lines out of the way before the good lines start happening. So if you're starting the best frame of the best keyframe, the first second you got on the computer, that's ideal and that may all be glamorous. And you may think that's what animators do, but animators draw a bunch of shitty drawings before they get into the real stuff. Uh, they do exercises and they do that, but too often do we put a crown on everything we draw that we don't realize we actually do need to stretch like we do with any other exercise. And drawing those circle studies might help you get over that little hurdle. Um, yeah, it gets rid of the sloppy pen control. It's all about confidence and speed. Um, uh, so my question would be how you would go about creating movement with just lines. Uh, so I hope I covered that question today. I need to work on capturing and exaggerating the gesture to avoid stiffness. Um, so the squash and stretch might help you. Uh, gesture is fun to do, but what's, uh, but, uh, what's the hardest part is the anatomy. I suck at body structures and I don't know where to start. So Ash, when it comes to body anatomy, what you have to do is find the geometric equivalent of all body parts. So you have the cylinder for the arms and the thighs, the squares for the forearms and the shins, uh, the spheres for any joints, especially the ankles or the heel of the foot, uh, a big square for the torso, a big sphere or cylinder for the hips. It depends on the character, it depends on their body type. So you saw Jessica Rabbit, she was just two circles. There was no square anywhere because that's just how they wanted to draw her, the perfect feminine figure or exaggerated feminine figure symbol. She, her body was a symbol. So it depends on what it is you're gonna be drawing. But um, uh, you have, if you're getting issues with anatomy, what I usually do with students when we're on our gesture unit is we start talking about uh, squares and, and cylinders. Everything is a square and a cylinder. Don't fall into the horrible trap of the potato bag because no, we are not just potato bags. We're not just water balloons. Uh, we are these completely geometrically sound, skeletally creatures with a little bit of moment of fat. So it's fat, bone, fat, bone. The shoulder is bone. The biceps and triceps are fat, really, really padded. You can hardly see the bone. We go right back to elbow, it's bone, and then fat for or forearms, and then wrists are all bone, and then hands are all bone. So you follow that pattern. There are so many instances of bone that there is so much to see in square, and the square, the cube, keeps emerging from under the skin. So you're having trouble with proportions and geometry because you're not actually using geometry. And how do you rotate without using a cube? It's, how, do you can, how can you tell a circle is rotating? It, it looks like a circle in all frames, no matter how you look at it. But a cube is how you appreciate perspective. So you need a little bit more of the cube in your life. Um, it was really frustrating at first. I didn't get a feeling for structure for my characters in my first draft. I try first to limit my amount of lines, uh, but every gesture looks too round, like the Michelin guy. <laughs> so I put some line in between to get a sense of solidity. Uh, the render was frustrating because of a lack because of lack of time, uh, skill, and clear reference. Some part of my anatomy, like the pelvis area, needs more study and understanding. My question is, where are the landmark on the body? Um, where do we put our geometric forms? Uh, where are the landmarks? Um, so the second step. So after the first frame is the gesture. The second frame is gesture plus cubes and shapes. The third frame is uh, lowering the opacity on the first two frames and drawing the final construction line. Not the construction, the final final lines, the final polish lines. The second step where you put all of your geometric shapes, the landmarks are elbows, shoulders, uh, knees, feet, and the pelvis. Um, it's n So much happens in between the pelvis and the shoulders. You could have a big chunky belly, you could have big boobs, you could have tiny thin little waist with no breasts, you can have a very, very triangular male athletic body very extremely triangular. 
Um, uh, so much can happen around the neckline, but the head, of course, absolutely, you start with that, and the feet, I've already talked about that. So head and feet are landmarks. Knees and elbows, very, very defined. I use the spring, a little spring. I've talked about this in one of my classes. You guys can find all the history in the uh, gestures and figures on my videos and in my channel. Uh, but I do use these specific little shapes to find the elbows. And uh, I usually find the um, collarbones as well whenever I can, especially if it's a lighter weight character. Um, and that's usually what helps me figure out where the neckline is. So... Um, that I hope that kind of gets you around where you're supposed to be putting these landmarks. You're not supposed to be drawing from head down. You're supposed to be drawing in like a, like you know section by section. You're supposed to be finding where you, where the elbows you want uh you want you, where you want the elbows to go. But at the same time, what you draw when you're done drawing is not going to be what you end up with. You're going to go back and adjust as you go. Remember, it's a recursive process. It's not a linear process. Um, the proportions, um, if you find it hard to do on the tablet, uh, your gestures are way better on paper, like I said, the, the, the stretching exercise is really wonderful to break that um, stiffness and get through that uh, uh, kind of rigidity of that dashboard, you feel alienated from the dashboard, it's not so intimate anymore when you're working with a tablet, even a screen tablet. Um, uh, was the skin tone, uh, it took a lot of trial and error to make it look kind of right, even then compared to the reference it still looked off. As a first attempt on digital medium, it was not that bad, I think. Um, I'll have to actually see yours and get back to you. Uh, I learned how little focus I was putting on gesture and that I was identifying contour and not motion. Beautifully put, wonderfully put. It was a huge learning experience. I'm so happy. It really challenged me to try and see an image in a different way. I wish I had more time to render because I spent so much time reteaching re, uh, re myself gesture. That's fine. The render was just a part two. I always try to give you guys two pieces of work. The most important part of the homework uh, was learning the motion, reintroducing yourself to uh, what it means to think about a frame, a gesture as part of a greater motion, how it starts, has a beginning and an end. I think that's uh, all, you know, the really, if you got that lesson, if you got all of that, then that's all that really matters. As long as you had time to appreciate um, this, this new way of thinking. I hope it continues with you. I hope it's just not a momentary revelation, but a permanent way for you to appreciate motion and animation. I noticed they kept wanting to noodle into detail too much, so I tried to be a bit more loose. That The way to avoid that is to zoom out. Um, so if anyone doesn't know, zooming, zooming out is the best way to, to take, get, get a good look over proportions. For those who had the questions about proportions and landmarks, zooming out is the best way. Once you fight the feet, find the, fight the feet, find the feet uh, zoomed out and the head, it becomes really easy to eyeball where the rest goes. And if you're not that, at that level of eyeballing, that's why we had a reference. Um, I feel it was the ideal first assignment for me. I'm very happy for that. I, ha I had heard you say in other videos that you assign gestures to your students right away, and uh, I've continued doing gesture drawings daily because I saw immediate improvement in my other work, my other more casual work. Uh, rendering was a huge challenge, though. So this month we are going back into rendering, actually. Um, so no more uh, kind of um, high narrative char uh, character designs. Uh, so we're going to go back into studies. Uh, so just like we started off back in January, I assigned you portrait studies, um, figure studies. We're going to go back into that now. Uh, but I do want to see constant attempts at this homework. I want to see this, also, this stuff come back in. And our video from this month, uh, from my personal work, so my, my design journal, um, uh, which I just posted, I hope you guys enjoy the rewards this month, um, was about drawing males and rendering male faces and learning how to balance uh, reference focal point and invent your own focal point despite what your reference says um, and all of that stuff. So we're going to go right back into that uh, very, very soon. I'll assign the assignment sometime by the end of the week. Uh, but um, I hope that'll kind of help us. Uh, it's good that it was your good first assignment, but uh, rendering being a huge challenge, we'll cover that. Uh, eventually, but do have a look at the old videos from this year, starting in January. We do cover a lot of rendering and talk about blocking a lot and how important blocking is, uh, how important smudging is. So have a look at the old video, Hazel. I hope it helps you. Thank you everyone for participating in this homework. I know it was really challenging. I know you guys had some issues. Um, uh, but, uh, oh God, I swear I didn't trace. I believe you. <laughs> I believe you. Um, but remember that it does have that effect. It does eventually look like that. Um, so rotoscope prevents the squash, squash and showing gesture. Yes, it does. You have to add it yourself. You have to be the, uh, you have to have the, the kind of take the liberty of adding it yourself. 
Uh, I was just going to say goodbye, but I'll look over the questions. An uh, animation style is usually how willing you are uh, to go off model and show gesture. Absolutely. Yeah. How to exaggerate gesture. Remember, that's the key word. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for joining. I know this challenge was really difficult. I really appreciate you guys doing the homework uh, because it means that I have something to give back. I have something to respond to. Um, so uh, have, have a wonderful day and I hope to see you guys in, uh, in our lesson today in like five minutes. Um, bye everyone.